everyone in this home is saving beyond their wildest dreams. Leon's 76th birthday sale is in full swing with spectacular interest-free savings and our gigantic selection of quality brand name home furnishings. Price so incredibly low you have to see them to believe them. All with no interest. Hurry, our sale ends soon. Like Leon's 76th birthday sale, join your friends and save with Leon's. That's why smart shoppers always buy ABC, because with ABC, you could save up to 20% over a leading brand. And when we ask shoppers to tell the difference between a wash done in ABC and one in the same leading higher price detergent... They both look clean and white. I can't see a difference. There is one difference, price. With ABC, you could save up to 20%, and that's a lot of money. Why pay more? Buy ABC. Back in the spring of 1970, in New York City, I interviewed a boyhood hero, Johnny Weissmuller, the Olympic swimming champion who became the best known of the Hollywood screen Tarzans. And then the following year, in August of 1971, in another orgy of nostalgia, I interviewed Ozzie and Harriet Nelson, talked about the golden years of radio back in the 1930s, 1940s. Johnny Weissmuller, Ozzie and Harriet, looking back to the days when movies were a dime and television hadn't been invented. A lot of actors made films about Tarzan of the Apes, but the only one who counted, as far as I'm concerned, was Johnny Weissmiller, who made 17 Tarzan movies, more than anybody else. He was the greatest swimmer of the first half century of this century. He'd won more gold medals than any other Olympic champion. Remember that phrase, me Tarzan, you Jane? Did he really say that to Maureen O'Sullivan in the movie? Well, that's the first question I asked him. Tarzan. Well, it was me, Tarzan, and Jane first, yeah. It and was. I, I don't know where I got it from. I, when I was a kid, I wrote, I read all the books of, on Tarzan when uh, Mr. Burroughs wrote them, you know. And uh, I remember my mother's name, Kala. You know, she was the mother ape that saved my life and all the other apes killed my mother and father. And I went through all this. So it was really, uh, is quite a when when i finally got this picture to do tarzan i had no idea i was going to get it because there were 150 guys making a test and i was just one of them and i just went to, to the studio to see if i could get to the commissary and meet some big stars <laughs> i didn't think i was ever going to be a movie star because i i, I was doing a, a nice job teaching kids how to swim at that time you know you worked Which for is BVD a BVD corporation yeah right? wasn't that plugging something? their bathing suits yeah BVD come and swim in your BVDs <laughs> it was quite a quite a uh, an exciting exciting uh, part of my life because it was on account of the swimming your BVDs, you know. But uh, when I did get the pictures and I, I had to come back, and they, they said you you're you're going to be Tarzan. I said, well that's fine. I said, now, what's your name? And I said, my name's Johnny Weissmuller. And they said, oh that's too long for the marquee. We have to change that name. I said, you're not going to change my name. I, I want my name because. Well, the, the, the director stepped in and he says, well, that's Johnny Weissmuller. He has all the world's records from 50 to a half mile. And uh, we better let, let his name in there so that uh, the producer says, why didn't you tell me? Give him his name and let's put some swimming in the picture. You mean to say that when you were picked for the, for the job of Tarzan, they didn't know you were the world swimming know. champ? No, they didn't. They, they got so. an extra bonus. Yes. <laughs> and I think you did too because you didn't settle for the amount of money they won. I you? know, and I was... I already had a real nice job, and they gave me a $75 contract, oh and I threw it back at them, and they had to start me at 500 which I, I turned professional for $500 a week for five years, which is pretty good for an amateur, you know? Oh, very good, yeah. So uh, when they had to do that, then they decided they'd pay me 500 a week for the duration of the picture. So the <laughs> picture took a year to make, so they, they really I got... I think it went up after that, too, didn't it? Oh, yeah. The price. Now, there's two things that interest me about these studios, which in those <coughs> days at least were tyrannical. One is, they told you you couldn't keep your hair short. You're the first of the long-haired kids, I well, guess, eh? Um, you, know, it, uh, you know, me, being a swimmer all my life, yeah. I had to cut my hair because when you swim and the hair comes in your eyes, you're going to get beat because you can't see where you're going. Okay. So uh, I had to let my hair go long. And, uh, but I cheated on them. I, 
cut it down and cut it off right oh, there, so, you know. So the it word heavy around the back. The back eh? Yeah. And the yeah. other thing they did, and I find this, I find this incomprehensible. They said, uh, "Wise Muller, you can't have a wife anymore. You were married, and they bought your wife off for ten thousand dollars, and she left for Chicago. You never yeah. saw her again. Is that right?" <clears throat> I think she wanted to do that anyway. Oh, I see. So the. <laughs> Because uh, uh, I, I thought it was going to be all right. But then uh, uh, in those days, they didn't want uh, movie stars to be married. They, they, they thought they'd lose some of the public. Yeah. But do you mean the studio could actually break up a marriage if they wanted to in those days? All of us sort of yes or no, to, between us anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> now, did you expect that Marina Sullivan, who was just a little bit of a thing, would play Jane? Had no idea who Jane was going to be. And of course, the, uh, uh, all the people in, in the Tarzan pictures had to be English. They had to have an English accent. And Maureen happened to be the only one at the Metro Goldwyn Mayor at that time that, that had an English accent. And, and she was kind of nervous about this kind of a thing. She's never climbed a tree in her life. They brought her over to do John, uh, uh, John McCormick's life. And, uh, and she played his daughter. And, uh, he was a singer, mm -hmm. you know, and she was a very sweet little thing, you know. Boy, she was, worried about it. You got her up in the tree about 10 feet and she'd start giving it this, you know, holding on and all that. So uh, I was very careful with her and, and uh, she finally got a lot of confidence in me that she was not going to fall off of the tree and she's going to well, be happy. Could, you could pick her up with one hand, couldn't oh, you? Oh, yeah. And often did, I think, if I remember the Tarzan <laughs> movies well, and I do. Um, <clears throat> tell me, did you ever get to Africa? Have you ever been to Africa in your life? Yes, I was there. I was in Cairo one time in the swimming meet, as far as I ever got there. But you never got to the part where Tarzan was supposed to be. <laughs> no, we did most of those pictures in Sherwood Forest, about 100 miles up uh, out of Hollywood. But I, was, they must uh, have built a fantastic set. Cause oh, they yeah, it was kind of rough. It wasn't mountains easy. Mountains and lakes. They had big lakes up there, and they built this tree house up about 40 feet up in the trees, and it was very nice. It was looked real. It sure did. <laughs> it looked real to me. <laughs> now... You did most of your own stunts, I'm told. You did most of the stunt work yourself. Well, I tried to, but, you know, uh, the studios get very nervous when they have about a half a million dollars sunk into a picture and, and the star is climbing around and might fall down and break his neck or something like that. So they, they tried to uh, get a double to do it, but uh, you could see it was a double. So I just used to tell the cameraman, I said, keep the cameras going because I'm coming next. Because as an athlete, you'd probably be as good or better than yeah, some of the stuntmen. Well, most of those stuntmen were athletes, yeah. you know. And, and uh, I once won the, uh, the swinging contest in the YMCA on the bars. You know, you, Did you? You go back and forth for 500 times. You let one go and you grab the other one. And, uh, and I was good at that, so I knew I wasn't going to about to let that thing go of 40 feet those up vines. in the air. No. <laughs> How did they work those <clears throat> vines? They were, I guess, ropes, really. They were really. ropes and they were covered. Yeah, they had to do it because... And then they were... They, they, how, how, how far would you swing in a vine? <clears throat> oh, uh, 30 feet. Oh, sometimes if we did a long shot, I'd go all the way. Just, just hang on, John. And if I didn't land on that tree, I'd, I'd swing back again. I see. And then I'd swing back again. And then I'd swing back again. And pretty soon they said, okay, get the ladder, get them down, try it over. But I wasn't going to let go. <laughs> <laughs> was there ever a time in this whole period in which you were actually frightened? Because I know that you, you got involved with animals. And oh, I was only frightened once in my life. We did a scene where I was in a cage, and they captured me, yeah. the, the natives. And uh, for some reason, they pushed it over a cliff, and it went down below. And it landed on the bottom, and then, of course, I, I wanted to get out. of so the gave, water? No, it was near the water, but not, not the water. So I landed down there, and I gave, oh, oh, and I called the elephants, and the elephants come running over, and they, and they tried to get me out of this cage. So we had an elephant that was quite tame, and he'd get on top of this, and he's supposed to pull the bars apart, you know. And instead, he pushed it in the lake. Oh, well, I said, well, this is my last trip, I guess. So uh, I knew I could hold my breath for three minutes. This is my limit, because I had to learn that to be a water polo player in the Olympic Games. So I just laid in there and held my breath for three minutes, and then that was supposed to be my end. But we had a very good, a smart prop man. And the minute that cage hit the bottom, he dove in and he put a rope on it, and they pulled me up. Yes, within three minutes. And I said, well, where you been, fellas? You know, what the heck? What am I supposed to do down there? <laughs> so he saved pretty... my life. He really saved my yeah. life. Just an awful feeling. Of... Oh, it's a horrible feeling when you think you're going to take your last breath. You worked, personally, you re seemed to me you wrestled all sorts of animals. These would be... Yes. These would be uh, uh, 
animals who were trained for this, but still, mm -hmm. when you're wrestling a lion, I, I, I would imagine that it takes some, some yeah, moxie. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing, uh, Pierre. Uh, this last Tarzan, uh, uh, Ron Ely, you know? Yeah. I ran the into television him. television Tarzan. Yeah, yeah, I ran into him in, in Mexico one time, and he came to me and said, listen, Johnny, how do you get to stop that lion from biting me in the rear end all the time <laughs> like this lion does to me? I said, well, you're silly, you know. I thought my lion, my, these are 500-pound animals, you know, and I taught them to come and knock me down and play with them. And I, in fact, I used to have lunch with them about two weeks before we started the picture, and he'd smell me, and I'd smell him, and we got to get buddies, you know. And they're uh, maybe three generations in camp t captivity, and they're kind of tame, you know. And you get to know them like a dog but they still have those claws and they still have those teeth and <laughs> you should see the trainer. He's got so many holes in him. He looked, yeah. he can't go out in the rain, you know. <laughs> this poor guy. And, uh, and so I, I, uh, I taught him to come and knock me down. And I'd say, come on, his name was Jack. I'm never forget his name. Jack, are you gonna come and knock me down? Come on, Jack, let's go. And finally, when I take my knife out, now he knocks me down. Now, and now this is the way, but he knocks me and he's playing with me. And then I roll around and my knife has a blade that goes in and comes out again, oh, you yeah. know? So it looked like I'm really stabbing him, you know? Yeah. And he let me hit him about three times, and then he gives me a growl from inside, and that's my secret, get out of there, John, oh, you know, because of, And then I just pat him on the back, nice, Jackie, see you later, come on, goodbye, and I walk away. And I told Ron Ely about that, I said, the way you do it, you swing off of that tree, and you run up behind that line, and you grab him in the rear end, He's got to bite you. Your dog will bite you if you, turn, if you do that to him. Okay. He says, I never thought of that. It's I a, says, you're a dumb Tarzan. It's a fascinating picture. It's a fascinating picture, a group of Tarzans <laughs> sitting around talking about their business, which is being Tarzan. <laughs> well, how do you work with a lion? Well, I go from the front. Oh, gee, I didn't know that. Just comparing notes about... What is the most dangerous animal of all the animals? You, you rode rhinos and elephants, yeah, and well, you wrestled crocodiles and... What is the most dangerous? Well, the rhino is, is, was bad because I didn't know about the rhino. I saw the trainer riding him back and forth. And I said, well, that doesn't seem it because the rhino, when he makes a turn, he runs like a bull. He runs the rear end behind in a, and it makes a, he can't make a fast turn. It's the most frightening so, animal I've yes, ever seen in yes, Africa was a rhino coming straight mm -hmm, at us in a, in a yeah, car. And, uh, and they're, they're strong. And so I figured I can ride them. So we did it. Thank God we did it the last day because we forgot about his skin. It's like a shark skin. And he just tore to hell. Oh, pardon me. <laughs> it's all right. My legs, all the pieces, because I started to bleed. And I says, keep that camera going, because I'm not going to do it again, because I'm coming back. So we, we got it that way. But uh, his skin is very rough. And, and uh, When you were working with crocodiles, too, I, wasn't there a danger there? They'd yes. bite you? Mm -hmm. Well, the crocodiles, we do that in shallow water. Yeah. And he's about, uh, it's, it's a gator, really, it's a gator, about eight footer. Yeah. And I get right in the middle of him. And the reason we do it in shallow water, because he sinks and then I have to let go. But here if he sinks, I can push him off the bottom. Oh, yeah. And I do the same thing. I have the knife and I give it to him. And he gets real waggly. And as soon as I found out that I could outswim a croc, because they can't go very fast. They got those little legs yeah. and a little skinny tail. He can't catch me because they eat on dry land. So, so as soon as I, if I did fall off, I'd go off to Pomona or somewhere, and they couldn't catch me. So I was very happy about that when I found out that I could outswim them. We'll be seeing more of Johnny Weismiller later in this program, but first it's time to talk to Ozzie Nelson, who began as a band leader and married his girl singer Harriet Hilliard, and then went on to make one of the best known and longest running radio and television series of all time, Ozzie and Harriet, after these messages. Hi, I'm Jim Martindale, and I'd like to introduce you to the Garden Weasel. It's a revolutionary five-in-one tool that makes gardening fun and easy. The Garden Weasel's three rotary blades mesh with a scissor action to break up topsoil. They uproot young weeds before they get a start. That mixes the weeds and leaves into the soil, and that's a mulch, and that's beneficial to your garden. The Weasel cultivates to a uniform two-inch depth, protecting your plant's roots. Remove the center blade for cultivating around seedling rows and young bedding plants and vegetables. Use one blade for those hard to reach areas. Insert the short handle and the weasel is perfect for plant boxes and greenhouses. The garden weasel is made of a rust-free alloy that's virtually self-cleaning. Simply hose it off and allow it to dry. If you have a friend that's into gardening like I am, the garden weasel makes a perfect gift. Look for this display. 
Now available at Sears, Simpsons, Eaton's, The Bay, Towers, Robinson's, and participating home hardware. It's perfect for Father's Day gift giving. I remember Ozzy Nelson when he led the band on a radio show back in 1932. And Harriet Hilliard was his singer. They married, and later they began the famous radio series titled The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, which ran for 10 years on radio, and then another 14 years on television, and which made stars out of both their sons, David and Ricky. Of course, Ricky Nelson went on to become a rock star in his own, as we will hear. Both had a long experience in show business. Harriet was born into the theater. Ozzy was leading a band in his uh, spare time while he was studying law at the university. So I started out by asking about that. As a matter of fact, I was involved in three things at the time. I was coaching football at Lincoln High School in Jersey City, and uh, I also had a dance band, and the dance band and started to do pretty well. And then we got a job at Glen Island Casino, which you may have heard of, oh. which was the cradle of many, many bands. Casaloma started there, uh, Jimmy and Tommy Dorsey started there, Glenn Miller started there, and we started there. And uh, so it started to, uh, to build up and we got a contract with Brunswick Records. So I had to take a night off from Glen Island Casino to go over to Newark to get my diploma. So we were supposed to get the diploma and then uh, they sit in the aisle and listen to some more speeches and prayers and so forth prayers for the clients <laughs> and so instead I just kept right on walking there was a kid outside with a with a car the, with a motor running and they were saying pss, 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 and I just kept right on going I had the diploma in my hand so I got in the car and we just about made it for Glen Island Casino for the for the broadcast that night and that was the end of your legal career I'm afraid it was did you did you really enjoy traveling with a band or did you find it a drag after a while Harriet no I loved it of course you have to be very young to do that you know That's it takes fun. a lot out of you yeah. but no it used to be fun it seems to me, in the great days of radio in the 30s, that you were on, this before you had your own program, that you were on an awful lot of programs. You were on, remember the old Bob Ripley program, weren't you? Right. Yeah, well, that followed, you see. That it was started, after Joe Penn. That's right, mm -hmm. yeah. But it was the same show. It was the Baker's broadcast. Remember, it was two years with Joe Penner and uh, two years with, with uh, Bob Ripley and a year with Feg Murray. I'd out here on the Frank coast. Murray, but I remember the Robert L. Ripley program. He yes. used to have the weirdest stories. When, yes. Believe yes. it or not. Spooky yeah, it was, stuff. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a strange <laughs> thing because I was supposed to represent the average man, you see, the Doubting Thomas, oh, yeah. and uh, they would have some outlandish thing. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Bob I, I, was a wonderful guy. But Bob used to like to take a, little, a few <laughs> snifters before he, you know, before the show. And occasionally he would overtrain. And uh, I tell you, the producer of that show was Ed Gardner. Did you ever meet Ed? The guy you know, who Duffy really Duffy Duffy's Tavern. Duffy's Tavern. Right. <clears throat> and uh, uh, so Ed was a real wild man. And he would get these ideas while the show was on. And it was being done live, of course, live radio. And I remember one time they had this lady from Atlanta, Georgia. And I don't know what monstrous lie they'd made up about her. <laughs> but anyway, I was supposed to be the Doubting Thomas. And it was a three-way interview between Bob Ripley and the lady and myself. So in between, we did a band number. And then Ed came up to me right at the end of the band number. And he said, I've written new pages for the next spot. Now we're on the air. So you can imagine what that did. So he came out, and they were all typewritten. So I read the page, and I said something to the lady like, I understand you're from Atlanta, Georgia. And she just kind of smiled, and something went on. Now it was Bob's turn, and he didn't talk, and he just <laughs> smiled. And I somehow stumbled my way all through page one, and then I turned and I saw what was wrong. Ed had given me three page ones, <laughs> had given the lady three page twos, and Bob three page threes. God, there's so many stories like that from the days of oh, radio, you know, know, when everything was live. People forget with oh, tape what it was like. I, I, I know. And wasn't it wonderful? It's I never been so. so much fun since. There was a kind of a tension for the listener, you know, because you knew it was live. Sure, right, oh, right. And right. terrible things sometimes yeah. happen. Right, And right. people rose to the occasion in the most marvelous ways. Oh, yes. I mean, scripts that, I, I know I was on the Bing Crosby show one time when we were out here. I was out here by myself making a picture. And I was on the Bing Crosby show guesting. And Ozzy had sent out this special material. David had just been born not too long before that. And it was called The Kid in the Three-Cornered Pants. And it was lyrics like you have never seen, very fast and lots of them, you know. And just as I opened my mouth to sing, Johnny Scott Trotter gave the downbeat, somebody opened the back door of the studio, and a draft hit it and took the page <laughs> sailing out into the audience, and there I stood. And I sang about 16 bars of I don't know what. I was juning and mooning all 
all over the place, but somehow you stumble through. That only happens when it's it live. It sure does. Well, yeah. we had, well, pardon me, we were doing, uh, uh, when we started doing The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet, the first year, yeah. the first few years of it, about the first three years, we did it live and then we went to tape. And uh, I know uh, something went wrong with the lights in the studio and they blacked right out, the completely blacked out Middle for six seconds. And I would have bet somebody that it was 12 minutes. <laughs> I bet, yeah. Because we, uh, we were doing a situation comedy. And everybody kept talking. Yeah. You know, it's hard for me to remember that it was radio because I see pictures with it. And I talked about this with Jack Benny years ago on this program, and he said <laughs> that he always thinks of his radio programs as television programs, and he can't remember sometimes that they I, weren't, they were so visual. I, I, I know just what he You means. invented pictures in your mind. They were to me, too. Well, you know what I was I think radio was much funnier than yeah. television <laughs> because oh, of that very reason. Yeah. You, you know what? Uh, uh, what, what we were concerned about when we made the transition. Now, we, we were on radio for 10 years with The Adventures of Ozzy and then uh, uh, television for 14, but we had three, I guess it was three or four years where we were doing, doing both. I'd yes. forgotten that. And, yeah. and when we started, to, to, when we were thinking about the possibilities of television, I, I had a funny thought in my, I thought, maybe we won't look like the people we're supposed to look like. Maybe we won't look like a family, you, you know? Because That's haven't true. you seen families that really don't look like families? And I was just hoping, I, uh, from our many personal appearances and so forth, I figured, well, the people have some, so and Harry did on quite a few pictures, and I'd done a few of them. They had a fairly good idea of what we looked like, but then when we brought the boys in, would we look like a, 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 a unit, you know, a family uh -huh. unit? Ricky Nelson was to become a bigger star than either of his parents. But was teenage stardom a problem? It was difficult for both the boys. Now, for instance, Rick uh, flew to Chicago one time, and there were between 15 and 20,000 kids at the airport, and one little girl broke her leg against the fence. And uh, he, he had some, a little girl fell out of the balcony when he was in, in Dallas, Texas. Fortunately, somebody caught her. And, he, and, and Rick said at that time, if you want a frightening experience, be up against a wall someplace and have about 10,000 screaming teenagers reaching for your clothes. And uh, it really made him, he went through a period where he was uh, quite an introvert because he never got a chance to uh, check into a hotel, never had a chance to even go up to, the, to a movie window and buy a ticket. They had to bring, when, when he went on tours, he'd have to go up the uh, freight elevator in hotels. And when he was making Rio Brava uh, in Tucson, they changed three different hotels and motels. Uh, yeah, and, and he would, he would uh, you know, find girls in his room, which sounds great on the surface, but uh, <laughs> it has its drawbacks, yes, too. And That's great say, if you know what to do them. Yeah, and he said he would be taking a shower, and all of a sudden, you know, there'd be some heads popping around there. But uh, he, It had its advantages and, and severe disadvantages. Fortunately, this... When we return, I will ask Johnny Weismiller about that famous Tarzan yell. Kids can't wait. Kids can't wait. Kids can't wait. When there's no waiting, kids can't wait to get home. Peanut butter lovers, meet Nutella, the hazelnut chocolate spread. Nutella's fresh, wholesome hazelnuts blended with milk and just the right amount of cocoa. When there's Nutella waiting, kids can't wait to get home. Remember when you bought that round wire stripper, used it once, and then threw it away? Introducing Omni Stripper, the patented flat blade power scraper that works. Omni Stripper powers off rust and paint from most any surface and won't gouge wood like the others. Plus, the flat blades are interchangeable and replaceable. Don't throw money away. Get Omni Stripper. The one that works is the one you'll keep. How about that famous yodeling yell that Tarzan gives as he swings through the jungle? Here's Johnny Weismiller. We thought of this yell. When I was reading these books, I used to read about this shrill voice and this thing, this, this awful cry that this Ottoman ape man hand, hand yeah. yeah. And uh, when I was a kid, I, 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 I'm, a, I'm a boy from Vienna, from, from the old country, you know. I wasn't born there, but my father and mother yeah. came. And we used to go to these German picnics on Sunday. Yeah. And they had a bunch of yodelers on there. I'll be darned. So uh, they, they tried the thing, and they said, Aah! And I used to 
the yodel and said, hey, do that again. So they got about three or four of them together, and, and they made a Tarzan yell out of it. Apparently, now, am I right in saying that that yell was on was recorded then, was it? Yes. And, and they, they used it every recorded, time. And yeah, and the, well, all the boys are using it now. All the Tarzans are using it. They're using your thing. yell? Oh, yeah. That's still you shouting? Oh, yeah, that's I hope, me. I hope you get paid for the yell. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. It's a th pleasure to be a help. <laughs> what do you think of the other Tarzans? I love them. I love Tarzan. I think Tarzan should go on forever. I think all the kids should have Tarzan. No matter who does it, I don't mind. I, I, I had a big ball doing it, and I only did one picture a year, and I, I wasn't really an actor. I just did that Tarzan the way I thought it should be done, and I, 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 I don't believe I'm an actor right now. I, don't, I just keep talking. Johnny Weismiller's last acting job was a bit part in that curious 1976 movie, Juan Ton Ton, the dog who saved Hollywood. He grew desperately ill, and in 1979, he won a battle with the staff of the Los Angeles Convalescent Home in which he'd been confined. They had tried to move him to a mental hospital because he was making loud and repeated Tarzan calls during the night. He died in 1984. Ozzie and Harriet went on to a new TV series called The Nelsons, this time without their sons, but with two female boarders. Ozzie died of cancer in 1975 at the age of 68. Harriet's still alive. She made her last movie for television in 1976. Now she's retired. Johnny Weismiller, Ozzie and Harriet, the way they were. Catch the dramatic conclusion of a romantic sizzler, California style. Join us for Malibu, tomorrow at 9. Blue Jays meet the Yankees on Monday Night Baseball, next on TV Level. Another world.